Good morning, Professor Cauton, uh, and thank you for being here with us in this uh, not so really sunny morning <laughs> at the University of Deusto in Bilbao. Uh, professor Cauton became Emeritus Professor in 2019, having served the University as Professor of Accounting, Dean of the Business School and Professor of Financial Ethics. Chris uh, now has a part-time role as Associate Director at the Institute of Business Ethics. He's uh, currently also a visiting professor in different European universities. Uh, my name is uh, Ricardo Aguado and I am Associate Professor of Microeconomics and Head of the Economics Area of Deusto Business School, University of Deusto. I think I have not mentioned that your uh, main university is uh, Huddersfield University. That's right. Okay. Professor Cauton, you have served the university for many years as a dean and also as a professor, so you know very well the challenges and limitations of business education. My first question for you is about our students in business schools. How can we inspire them in our undergraduate programs, MBA programs and PhD programs so that businesses could be places where the interests of all stakeholders are taken into account and in addition to that, the dignity of people is protected and the common goods of society fostered? Okay, that's a big question. Yeah, Ho hopefully we have one or two hours to, uh, to explore it. But no, let's think about some of, the, some of the priorities. I think one of the things we have to think about, and this I was always conscious of as a dean, is the different students. Mm -hmm. and, and think about a couple of different dimensions. One is that some students have experience, so maybe our MBA students, for mm -hmm. example, and some students have very little experience or no experience of business. So particularly our undergraduates often, mm -hmm. they don't have much experience. So we have to think about that for, for, for starters, I think. And one of the things that often leads to is uh, an unexpected result, I think, in terms of inspiring the students. So you might think that those with experience are going to be in, this, in doing their MBAs because all they want to do is to make as much money as possible. Now, there's a big investment, this, that mm -hmm. is often there, but if they're post-experience, they realize the complexities of business and they understand that they want to do business with people who are going to be trustworthy, for example, okay. uh, and who are going to treat them well as suppliers or customers or whatever. So, so I think sometimes it's the other way around, that the student, the undergraduate students often have uh, very naive views of business that okay. you know, it is just profit maximization and it is just rough and tough and all you do is try and kind of uh, win out against the other guy in any way you can. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've got to recognize where the students are coming from. So one of the things I used to do with undergraduates was to uh, get them to reflect on their uh, other studies because when we teach business ethics, we've got to remember they're studying other subjects as well. And those subjects all have their normative foundations, mm -hmm. even if people don't... Uh, don't admit to it. So the finance guys make an assumption that this is the goal of the firm. The accounting guys make a slightly mm -hmm. different assumption. The marketing people make different assumptions. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we sometimes have to do with the, the undergraduates is open their eyes a little bit to, in a sense, the models they've already been given and to show them how they're inconsistent, which suggests they're not correct, and, and to show them that there's more to business than maybe they'd realized from their other modules, their other courses. Um, so I think that's an important thing to do. I think another thing to do with the undergraduates is actually to draw on whatever experience they have, because they do have some as customers, mm -hmm. sometimes as part-time workers. So I used to get them to reflect early in the course about their experience, maybe as a part-time employee working, serving burgers and fries. Mm -hmm. I won't say at which yeah. company because we're not advertised for advertising here, but that, get them to reflect on their experience of, of what they see. Whereas with the post-experience people, you've got that to, to work with already. So I think mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the things to do is to recognize your students, but also then to recognize that particularly undergraduates, some of them are very motivated and very concerned about things in the world. And mm -hmm. so they're quite easy to connect with, whereas others maybe are harder to connect with because they're just coming because they have to do a degree. So they're going to, their parents yeah. have sent them to do business mm. or they're just doing business because they want a job. And, and they're harder to open up sometimes. Um, what I tended to do with a lot of my students was to make sure that they could study things that were relevant to their intended future career, their intended okay. future experience. So I had a lot of um, travel and tourism students started coming to my course. Mm -hmm. So I let them analyze companies in that industry rather than forcing okay. on them. Okay. Looking at particular sort of, so I think you try to make things as relevant to people as possible and you try to disturb, if not replace, but you try to disturb simple ideas about business that they might have so that they can open up a bit 
at mm -hmm. other possibilities. And, okay. uh, and I did used to organize my module around the idea of stakeholders as well. Okay. Not, not driving a hard view of stakeholder theory, but I think people find it easy to think about stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, because they can put themselves in different mm -hmm. shoes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but, but, but trying to keep it relevant for them, I think. Okay. Um, you have developed meaningful research and also teaching in the field of financial ethics. In your view, which is the importance of the governance system of a corporation in relation to the ethical quality of that corporation? For example, <clears throat> do you think that multi-stakeholder governance is going to increase the ethical quality of the management decision making in a given corporation? Well, I think there's, there's, there's two kinds of codes. One is there's just a general governance code, and mm -hmm. we're seeing an evolution of those across the world. I'm most familiar, obviously, with the UK corporate governance code. Well, normal. 1992, that started out as actually not a corporate governance code. It was on the financial aspects of corporate governance. And over mm -hmm. years, more things have come in. Risk, which also brings in the idea of ethical risk. That okay. was introduced into the code after the Turnbull report. And more recently also, the need to report on Section 172 of our Companies Act 19, uh, 2006, which, which mentions stakeholders in an instrumental stakeholder world, uh, way, but it actually forces directors to of listed companies to think about stakeholders and how okay. they're treating them. So that can that can set the tone. And there are responsibilities now on directors, not to serve stakeholders, but to think about stakeholders. So that's a start. Mm -hmm. Then the question is what tools they might have. So what we've seen uh, in the UK and in many countries is that a lot of companies have introduced codes of ethics, codes of conduct. And I think if you go back to the 1970s and 80s, when they first started to appear, they were a very defensive mechanism. It was mm -hmm. after the, FC, the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, the Federal Sentencing Guidelines in the States, have a code and it might mitigate your fine. So mm -hmm. there's a simple one page code of ethics, job done, tick. Okay. But now I think uh, codes have matured a lot, partly because of changes in, uh, in the way the Department of Justice looks at things in the States. So it's not just about having a code and ticking a box. It's, well, what's the code like? What's the support framework around it, which we talk about at the Institute of Business Ethics? So it's okay to have a code, but does anyone know about it? Do you train mm -hmm. people on it? If someone breaks the code, do you discipline them? All those kinds of things. So what this leads us to, I think, is the idea that a code of ethics is sufficient uh, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think most companies need one, but just having a code is not it's enough. Not enough. Uh, it's, what does the code say? How is it used? How seriously is it taken? And when it comes back, if we connect that to governance, is that code supported by the top leadership? Mm -hmm. Do they talk about it, not just when they're talking about ethics, but do they talk about it when they're talking about strategy? Mm -hmm. And do they role model it? And okay. also, do they encourage the managers below them to make it relevant, that word mm -hmm. again, to their employees in their context? Do they encourage them to reinforce the message? Mm -hmm. So it's not just tone from the top, which connects with governments, but it's tone through the organization from above, which is important. So there's a lot of things need to be in place to make a good code of ethics work. Uh -huh. But it, it has a role to play and it can be quite powerful but it needs serious okay. work. Okay, now <clears throat> uh, let's, let's talk about other, other question. In your view, which role should play ethics in guiding the financial decisions of managers? Okay. If any. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a big question. So um, I, I think what, if you think about uh, financial decisions in different sorts of organizations, then obviously a, a minimum is that they meet the law. Okay. Now, if we just start there, that immediately in, uh, introduces a risk. Because if people just want to meet the law, they think, does this meet the law? Yes. And on they go. And of course, it may be that it only just meets the law. And then when it's actually put into effect, it doesn't meet the law. Okay. So I think that's, that's one kind of thing that can happen. And also, if you ask people just to meet, just to comply with the law, then it introduces the possibility, ah, can I get away with not quite complying with the law. Is there a gray hmm. area here or a loophole that I can exploit? Mm -hmm. So it, it introduces ethical risk okay. if you just think about obeying the law. So one of the, way, one of the reasons for introducing a more ethical mindset is actually that people will aim a bit higher 
than the law mm -hmm. and not play games with the law. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's one, one thing about ethics in decision making. I think then the other thing is, well, what kind of organizational culture are you trying to create? Mm -hmm. So if you encourage people to think about ethics in their decisions, then it means that it's something they think about and they talk about and they need to talk to colleagues about. So there's, a, there's some ability to generate a, a positive mm -hmm. ethical culture. And as we know uh, from research, it's not conclusive, but there is a suggestion certainly that being ethical does not in the long run cost you. Mm -hmm. Depends what you do and how much you do. And there's lots of complications, but actually for many businesses, it's a good investment to mm -hmm. be ethical uh, and so you don't want to encourage your managers just to take the quick route to, uh, to, to easy money. But I would say that as someone interested in business ethics, wouldn't I? But I, I do see cases uh, of companies where when I talk to the ethics officers, uh, you know, how do you make the business case for ethics in your company? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. One of them said to me recently um, from a very large French company, she said, um, well, I don't need to go into a comp uh, uh, complicated calculation. All I need to do is to, to show them one or two bad cases that have happened to other companies. Yeah. And suddenly they go, oh, <laughs> yeah, we need to be serious about ethics. Mm -hmm. That's the argument about the business case. So in that sense, uh, how can we accompany the, that process of introducing ethics in corporations from our business schools, from the academia? Yeah. What, what uh, role could we play to help corporations to introduce those ethical decisions? Yeah, I think... Uh, I think probably our students are going to be our biggest, our biggest way in. I mean, okay. I, the relationship between business schools and, uh, and practitioner communities, as we know, is problematic in many parts of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Is our research read? Is it relevant? We have to translate the research. Are they even interested in what we're doing? Maybe not. In some, some places they are. I mean, it's been very mm -hmm. interesting for me as a largely career academic to now be working closely with business. And okay. I do find that seem to be interested in what I have to tell them and, uh, okay. and I learn a lot from them as well. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think if we can get the, the language right and translate it right, I think they are interested. But still, given, uh, given our main business in business schools is the teaching of students, mm -hmm. I think they have to be uh, our way into influencing the business world, you know, the future generation of leaders, which goes back, okay. back to your first question, is just... Yes. Is just raising with them the possibility of being ethical. And for those who are already committed, you know, I said the two types of students, those who are not interested, those who are interested, mm -hmm. for those who are interested to show them there is possibility of having a career in business which can be ethically fulfilling. Mm -hmm. It will be ethically challenging as well, but life is. But, you know, don't assume that just because your fellow students think business is like this, that doesn't mean it is like that. There are actually are opportunities for you to make a difference in business and have a a proper, uh, a proper good career, if I put mm -hmm. it that way, that makes a positive contribution. So that's part of our, part of what we can do, I think. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for sharing with us your views and insights about business ethics and the role of business schools in this field. It's been a pleasure to be with you in this interview. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much.